Okay, now years and years ago, I was walking uh, through a village in northern Scotland. I'm going to say that it was Strathpeffer, but I could have that wrong. I was walking through a village in northern Scotland, and I saw as part of a window display on the high street, I saw a large historic advert for a job in Inverness. So you get the picture, you get the idea. I'm walking past the shop, there's this historic advert. I think it was for a job from the 1940s and 1950s in Inverness. And I stopped to have a look at this and burst out laughing. What I must have looked like in this high street in Strathpeffer, killing myself laughing by myself, I don't know. I'll tell you why I began to laugh. I read this, okay? So this was part of the job package in the 1940s or 50s. So alongside the salary and alongside the holiday allowance, the advert stated this as an incentive to apply that should the successful applicant happen to be an elder in the church, the company guaranteed time off for meetings of the church courts. There you go, isn't that brilliant? What an incentive, and the elders understand this in the room tonight, what an incentive to apply for the job. You would never have to miss a Kirk Session meeting ever again. Isn't it amusing? Is it amusing? I think so. But you're probably with me that in a sense there is a degree maybe of sadness with that as well, because we all know, don't we, that that would never, ever (laughs) ever happen today? Would it? No chance. Not a bit of it. That in a very, very short space of time, there has been this enormous sea change in this country's attitude towards the Christian faith, hasn't there? We have gone from in such a short space of time, a place where we were almost proud, could you say, of, of our Christian roots and Christian heritage. We've gone from that to a place where today, let's be frank about it, that the Christian church does know something of opposition in 21st century Scotland. Now, please hear it carefully. I'm not saying that we are persecuted, not, of course, to the extent that some of our brethren are in parts of Western Africa just now or the Middle East, but isn't it true? In our government, in our schools, in our workplaces, that the Christian today in Scotland knows something of intimidation or mockery, ridicule, something of opposition today. Well, this evening, as Paul continues in this wonderful letter, what he does is he turns, maybe you've noticed it, did you? He turns from his own predicament. Isn't that what we've been looking at in recent weeks? His own predicament in chains, in Rome, and what he's going through. And he turns actually now to contemplate and mention the situation of the Christians in Philippi, in Macedonia. Turns from himself to them. And as he does this, what we see, not only something of how it is that a Christian should respond to opposition, but we see even here something of why it is in God's providence, in God's purposes, why it is that the church of Jesus Christ is opposed So, can I encourage you, please, right now, to make sure this portion of Scripture is open in front of you, and the young people in the room as well, if you can keep an eye on Philippians 1, 27 to 30. This evening really will base things around three words tonight, three words. That's simple enough for us, isn't it? So, the first word is the word title, title. Okay, now... We're all technologically savvy in the room, aren't we? We've got our finger on the pulse when it comes to technology. And so we all know what is meant by a drop-down menu. We all know what that is, don't we? Let's say we go on to the St. Peter's website. Okay, what would we find there? There'll be a banner that'll maybe say, uh, what we believe. Okay, what happens? You double-click on that banner, what's going to happen? Come on. A breakdown of that theme, that topic, will, it will 
drop down in front of your eyes. Well, as Paul starts this section, that's almost kind of what we've got in front of us. Obviously, it's not a drop-down menu. But actually, as Paul starts here, what we've got is almost an umbrella banner, an umbrella title that what Paul is going to do is unfold this over the next maybe chapter or so. So I think you and I ought to read it together. So if you look with me to verse 27, what's this big umbrella banner theme in this title? Do you have verse 27? Let's read it a couple of times. He says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let's read it again. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, in order for you and I to get to grips with that, I think the first thing that we need to do is establish what Paul is not seeing there, what he's not seeing. See, a few weeks ago, and uh, maybe, you, you remen- maybe you remember that I mentioned um, a film um, as an illustration. I mentioned the film Saving Private Ryan. That film, a movie, tells the story, this sort of daring rescue of a soldier in World War II. I think it was World War II, was it? Yes, it was. Well, if, if you've seen that film, you'll maybe... Remember the, the, the scene that sits at the kind of apex, the climax of the movie. Okay, so w- what happens? Captain Miller, Tom Hanks, Captain Miller, the guy who's been sent in to rescue Private Ryan. He, Captain Miller's been shot and he is dying. This apex is, you know, you can imagine the emotional moment in the film and he's dying. He's sitting there. What does he do? But he grabs a hold of Private Ryan and he brings it to himself. And he's going to, his last two words, he whispers two words into Private Ryan's ear, just about to die. And he says, Earn this. You see it? Do you see what he's saying? Saying to Private Ryan, in the way that you live from this point on, you've got to merit the sacrifice that has been made for you from this point on and the the choices you make, the things that you do, you've got to try and earn the fact that I've died for you, the fact that I've lost men for you. Earn this, earn this. Listen to me. We have to be clear on this. That is not what the Apostle Paul is saying in Philippians chapter 1. Do you understand? That as he, though the fact that he's talking about conduct and behavior, here Paul is not saying, whatever you do, conduct yourselves in a manner that secures and earns and achieves your salvation. In fact, perhaps you're new to biblical Christianity. Perhaps you are new to St. Peter's, maybe joining the live stream tonight or watching this video at some point in the future, new to Christianity, then I would encourage you to to linger on that fact. The reality that the, the message of the gospel, the message of biblical Christianity is in fact that we cannot earn, we cannot merit salvation, we cannot merit reconciliation with God. So what has God done? Listen. What has God done but step in for us? The Lord Jesus Christ has lived our righteousness for us. He is the one who has secured for his people righteousness. He has secured heaven. He has then borne our punishment in himself. God stepped in. We cannot, we cannot live in a way that earns our salvation. So we know what this, we know what Paul doesn't mean here, but what does he mean? Well, in order to address that, I need you just now to cast your mind back, if you can, to the beginning of this sermon series <laughs> and to what was said right at the start about the city of Philippi itself. Now, casting your mind back to the beginning of this sermon series already takes a little bit of effort, doesn't it? Because we are talking not just weeks, but we're talking months ago, and we are not yet out of chapter one, uh, friends. But do you remember what we said about Philippi? Do you remember? I wonder if the 
young people can remember, we said that Philippi was a Roman colony. And do we remember what that means? Of course we do. We, that it was a colony means that though Philippi was miles and miles and miles away from the capital of the, the empire at the time, what was Philippi? And if you'll allow this, it was a, a Rome away from Rome. In a sense, wasn't it though? So Philippi was a city whose inhabitants were classed as Roman citizens. What does that mean? It means that the inhabitants of the city had real privileges. I mean, they had the same status and the same legal rights as the inhabitants of Rome itself. And you gotta understand, the inhabitants of Philippi were so proud of this. You can see that, can you? You can almost hear them. We are Roman citizens. We are not like these hicks who are living beside us. We are different. We live according to different values and different standards. And I would ask you to look back for a moment at verse 27. Because what I want you to notice is a very clever play on words almost here. Now, you're looking at verse 27. Do you see the word conduct? You need to understand that that what you have behind that word in the original is the idea of citizenship. What's Paul saying? He's saying, conduct yourselves as citizens. Do Do you see what he's doing? It's so clever, it is ingenious to a people in Philippi who know all about civic pride. What is Paul doing? He is reminding of their true status in Jesus Christ. What is he saying there? He's saying to the Philippians, he's saying to the Macedonians, he's saying, you remember, you are citizens actually of heaven. He's saying to them as part of a church, you are actually part of a colony of heaven itself. He's saying to the Philippians, reminding them of their calling. They are called to reflect the standards, the values, not just at Rome, But they're called to live in a way that reflects the standards of heaven, that reflects the standards of, what does he say? Of the gospel of Christ itself. Isn't it clever? Using the word play, reminding them of their true status in Jesus Christ. Now, as we consider this for St. Peter's, for you, for me tonight, there's perhaps a really obvious implication, I think, that jumps out of this. Would you agree we are so prone to truncating the gospel in our thinking. You can see what I mean, can't you? We think about the gospel and we think all it is is a message of how we can be saved and we leave it there. But what is the implication here? Conduct yourselves worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is the implication not that there actually are ethical, moral values associated with the good news of salvation that our sanctification as well as our justification is part of the gospel of God. There are things that really are worthy. There are practices, values that are worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there are also practices and values and standards and habits that are not worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So at this point, simple. I want to lay out Two questions for you to consider just now. Two questions to pose to you. First is this, Christian friend, at this point in your life, how are you thinking about your identity? What is at the forefront of your self-understanding? Come on. In the middle of this football tournament, are you thinking about yourself only according to your national identity? Is that what's first and foremost? You know, I am Scottish. Is that, is that I am English? Is that, is, that where you're, is that where you're at? Or what about for some of you, maybe even in the midst of this really difficult new sexual gender revolution that's taking place, is that, is that affecting your self-understanding, the way that you view yourself? Or, come on, as a Christian tonight, Right at the front of your mind, are you seeing who you are, your identity? You are in Christ. Who are you but a citizen 
of heaven above. Who are you as part of St. Peter's Free Church? You are part of a colony of heaven itself. How are you thinking about yourself, your identity? And then a second question that follows on from that. Look at this exhortation. Come on. Are you following this exhortation? Am I following it? Verse 27. You know, in light of who we are, are you and I striving to live very differently to the people around us? Come on, in the way that you are living just now, are you really, really seeking to, to live according to the standards of that far off country, living in accordance to the, to the standards and the values that God has set out really clearly in his words? Or to make it very simple, are you and I conducting ourselves, what does he say, in a manner worthy, worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ? So the first word is the word title. Let's move on. Second word that we have to consider is the word tenacity. Tenacity. And and here, as we did just a couple of weeks ago, um, I want to uh, use Google Earth. You remember what I said about that a couple of weeks ago. Let's use Google Earth. You can see why, perhaps, as you think about Philippians chapter 1. Because from this really broad comprehensive appeal for a certain type of conduct. Do you notice what Paul does? From this great, big, global, comprehensive appeal, he zeroes in on, he zooms in on one aspect of Christian behavior. And what is that? It's how we respond, how you respond, I respond to opposition. How do we respond to opposition? Now, I don't know, I think partly... Partly because of how familiar I think some of this is going to sound to many of you in the room. Partly because of how familiar it will sound to you. I think it's actually worth mentioning the form of opposition that the people of Macedonia, the Christians in Philippi, were facing. This will sound familiar to some of you at St. Peter's, I think. I want to suggest to you that the Philippians were facing both Opposition from outside and inside the church. Is everybody with me? So the Philippians, the Macedonians, they're facing pressure from the inside, pressure from the outside of the church. What do I mean? Well, first from Philippians chapter 3, which we'll get to in the next decade, I promise you. But from the beginning of Philippians chapter 3, we see really quite clearly that there were false teachers, there were what are called Judaizers that were present in that congregation. So what is that? Think about it for a moment with me. So that's people inside the church putting pressure on believers, pressure on Christians for what they believe. Does that not sound familiar to you? Some of you have spoken to me about your previous church experience in other places. I'll repeat it. People putting pressure on Christians for what it is they believe. That sounds familiar to some of you. What was the other side of it? Outside the church. Pressure from society. You only need to cast your mind back to Acts chapter 16. What was Paul's experience from the society in Philippi? Remember it? The hostility that the Apostle Paul faced. Do you not remember? Think about the pressure from society from a Nero-inspired, a Nero-led Rome. Do you see? Pressure from inside the church, pressure from outside, from the society. Does that not sound familiar to us? So what does Paul say? How is it that we should respond to ridicule at work and opposition? Well, I I read this phrase this week. I absolutely love this phrase. I'm going to read it out and see what you think of this phrase, but I'm a big fan. Listen to this. Somebody writes this, uh, that here in these verses, when we're thinking about opposition, here Paul sets forth a vision. Wait for it. And it is a vision of muscular Christianity. Here Paul sets out in the face of opposition a vision of muscular Christianity. Do you like the idea? Muscular Christianity. You do, if you look at verse 28 with me, you'll see what the writer is getting at. Let's look at the exhortations. What's the, do you see it in verse 28? What does he say? He says, don't be frightened. 
first thing. Do you see it? Be bold. If you're opposed, be strong. But then go back a bit. Look at verse 27. What do you do in the face of opposition? Do you notice he says, stand firm. Again, isn't it muscular? Do you see what you have to do? You have to do not give an inch when you're opposed. And then read a look at the middle one. Isn't the middle one tremendous? I mean, it depends on your translation, but it's either contend for or strive for the faith. Do you see how that is the counter of the previous one? How is it muscular Christianity? What is he saying? He's saying, don't just defend yourselves. Be on the offensive when you're opposed. Do you see? It's the idea of fight back. A counterattack. A counterattack of grace. Fight back armed with the good news. Isn't it great? How do we respond? How do we respond? Muscular Christianity. Now that is Great, but let's lay it aside for a moment. I, I, I want to include the young people here. And uh, I want to tell you just about an advert that I watched on TV many years ago. I'll tell you how many years ago it is. I can't remember what the advert was for. That's how long ago it was. Okay, but it was topical because it was a football advert. A football advert. Now, it was told from the perspective of a child in goals. Okay, you get the idea? So he's a goalie, a little boy in goals. What happens? Well, the opposition team get the ball on the halfway line. Okay, and then all of a sudden, wait, ready for this, guys? His teammates disappear. They all just disappear. They've evaporated. And then what happens? The opponents, they all grow into giants. And they all get as one, and they're all running towards the goalkeeper. Can you imagine him? Can you imagine how scared he is with his big goalie gloves on? Can you imagine? He's looking about, and he's completely by himself. He's petrified. He's completely, completely isolated. Well, friends, if we left things as has been expounded at this point. Is it not the case that, to be honest, you and I could feel very much like that goalkeeper faced with society in, in, in Scotland? Think about what we have said. We have to stand firm. What, alone? Alone? Stand firm against these opponents? What was it? Fighting back? A counterattack? Alone? In a place like this, in a world like this, wouldn't it be terrifying for us? Be petrifying? Well, praise God, because that is not the message of the text. And surely everybody in the room noticed the main theme that Paul has at this point. Do you see it? Main theme is what? It is dealing with opposition is a corporate matter for the people of God. The idea that there's got to be unity, togetherness, as we fight. Just look back at the text with me for a moment. Do you notice, surely you did, three times Paul makes a very, very similar point. Do you see it? Look at verse 27. Now, I ask you, you give me the answer here. How are we to stand firm? Do you notice? We stand firm in one spirit. I, I think that possibly should have a capital S. You see, why don't you, Paul, pointing us in, to the one in whom we have and find our unity, the Holy Spirit of God. But read on, though the, 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 I don't think the NIV brings it out, the ESV does, Paul goes on to say, you and I, faced with opposition, we've got to be of one mind. You see again the idea of unity. But then please, I ask you, please notice the third one, verse 27. L notice how he qualifies how we are to contend for the faith or strive for the faith. Do you see it for the third time? What's the word you've got there? It'll either be the word we strive or contend together, or, yes, we, we strive, we contend side by side. Isn't that lovely? Do you know what that is? It's an athletic metaphor, or maybe even a military metaphor. What's the idea? In a hostile environment towards the gospel, that's the idea of you and I, in a rugby scrum together against our opponents. 
Or it's the idea of you and I on the front line of the battlefield, you and me, and the brothers and sisters in here, but with our shields interlocked going into battle. Do you see it? How is it we are to contend? How are we to, how are we to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel? Here, in the face of opposition, it's not just that we stand against the opposition. You and I are to stand together against the opposition. And before we move on, can I please just mention one particular area in St. Peter's Free Church where the rubber of this really hits the road? Because I think it's probably fair to say, you can argue with me later, but I think a lot of us, if we're honest, would admit that we lead fairly sheltered lives. Like You can think back in times where you've been opposed for your faith, And you can think back at times where you've been ridiculed for your faith. But you and I, most of us in this room, we don't face that on a daily basis. But there is one subsection of St. Peter's Free Church that really does face that on a daily basis. It's ridiculed and attacked with anti-Christian rhetoric all the time. I think you know to whom I refer. The children, the young people, the students in St. Peter's. Is it not the case that on a daily basis, barrage of anti-Christian thought, barrage of abuse and ridicule, perhaps it's the case that we as churches in Scotland have to waken up to that reality and how it is affecting the next generation of, of believers. Are we to stand together against opposition What does that mean? That means that you and I, regardless of our age, we have to stand side by side with the young people in this room. That means that we have to help them. We have to speak to them about what they're facing. It means that regardless of our age, we have to be praying for the young people on a daily basis. As some of them move classes after the summer, as some of them move school, after the summer, as some of them think about it, move into the melting pot of university after the summer. Friends, we have to stand side by side. We have to pray for them that they might be empowered by this one spirit. And why? That they might be able to defend and contend for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we see title, we see tenacity. And the third and the last uh, word this evening is the word theology. Theology. Uh, Because yes, Paul has been addressing this critical matter, hasn't he? How do we respond uh, to opposition? And we've seen we respond together, united. There's another question, isn't there? We're all forever wrestling with in the life of the church, isn't there? How do we respond? Fine. Why? Isn't that it? Why? Why is it that opposition to the church is never ending? Why is it that it seems such an integral part of the Christian experience to face opposition? Well, as Paul closes this little section, I think he addresses that. In fact, what he does is he gives two theological uh, explanations. In fact, he tells us this. He tells us what God is doing in us, for us, as we face opposition. So I want to end with these two. For the first, can I encourage you to look at verse 28, please, with me? Let's do this. We're closing with these, but look at verse 28. You got it? So what's God doing here? Now, I'll read it to you. Without being frightened in any way, let's move on. Now, think about it. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed but that you will be saved and that by God. So what is is suffering, this opposition? The first thing is that it's actually a proof and a proof from God. Now you can see that, can you? In fact, you can see that there's, in a sense, there's two sides to the coin. On one, Paul is saying that this opposition is something of an omen of judgment for the persecutor. I wonder if everyone is with me. An omen of judgment for the persecutor. 
Do you see it? It's the person persecutes, opposes the church, but sees the people of God stand firm and powered by God. What is God doing in that situation? God is pointing that persecutor not only to the truth of the gospel, but pointing that persecutor to the judgment that they will face. That's one side of the coin. What's the other side of the coin? That the same is true for us. The opposition is a sign for us. Can you think about that for a moment? That as we stand firm, as we endure, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, God is at work. God is pointing us to the certainty of our salvation. You can see it, I hope. As we persevere under pressure in society in Scotland, as we come through that, what do we see? We see God confirm we belong to him. God confirm that we are his people. What is opposition? But it is First, a proof, a proof from God. But then let's close with the second one. If you look at verse 29, it's a present from God. Look at verse 29. This is a verse. For it has been, now let's pay attention to the language here, verse 29. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe, but also to suffer for him. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Some of you are thinking, come on, this is, it's almost the music, isn't it? It sounds almost like Paul is saying that the opposition and suffering that we experience, it's almost like Paul is saying that it's an honor, isn't it? That it has been granted to you by God. It sounds almost as though that God, this is Paul saying that this opposition you face is, is a gift from God. Doesn't it almost sound like that? Listen, please. Listen carefully. That is exactly, isn't it? Exactly what God's inerrant word is saying to us this evening. That because the opposition we face is actually an instrument that God uses in our sanctification. Because the opposition that we experience is something that God uses to make us more like Christ. Paul is confirming for you this evening that opposition and the trouble we face is, a, is, in a sense, God uses it so much. It's a gift. It's a, a grace that God shows to the church. Indeed, can you see what Paul's doing? Paul is working to utterly, radically transform our understanding of persecution and opposition to move us from a place where we're intimidated and we're scared of Scotland and the way society is going to move us from there to a place where we can look at opposition in a new light, way for it, that we can actually look at opposition in a positive light. I mean, what did Jesus Christ say? Matthew 5. You know it all. You all know it. Does Jesus say, oh, oh, you know, unfortunate are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake? Does he? Does he say that? Does he say condemned are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake? Isn't it amazing? I think what he does say, blessed. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. And what happens in Acts chapter 5? I mean, it's one of the most staggering phrases in all the Bible, isn't it, in Acts 5? They're beaten for their faith. They're beaten for their faith. And they leave that place rejoicing, having been counted worthy, is suffer for the name. And isn't it amazing? Isn't it? Such is God's goodness to us, such is his grace, that he will use even the persecution, even the mocking, even the intimidation, even the opposition, he will use it in your life. He will use it to grow you in Christ's likeness. He will use that opposition, that ridicule, that hurt. He will use it and use it to grow you, to grow you in grace. May it be then that you and I leave St. Peter's, we go into Scotland, we engage with a society, may it be that each one of us who are Christians, we stand. I seek to stand this week, the power of Jesus Christ. Let's stand firm. Let's stand together. Let's stand for Jesus Christ, shall we? After all, is it not the case that he is the one we owe everything to? He is the one who has endured opposition 
the likes of which we will never know. He has endured suffering and opposition. And why, Christian friend, all that you might know, a bestowal from God, a giving, a granting from God of everlasting life. Surely we know it is Christ and he alone who is worthy. He has earned salvation for us. He alone is worthy of praise. Friends, let's bow our heads and let's pray.